the, the amount of automation in cars has been increasing for a long time. And um, it's, it's clear that full automation is on its way. We already have driverless trains, of course, in, in London's Docklands, um, on, on the Dockland Light Railway, in Gatwick Airport, on several metro systems around the world and, and a number of other places. And for many people, driverless cars seem an inevitable next step for cars. There seem to be announcements every week that fully driverless cars will be arriving soon. But as we'll see, there are many questions that have not yet been answered. The UK government has been encouraging, consulting on, and f facilitating the development and introduction of driverless cars for a number of years. In February this year, they published uh, a draft bill to legislate for compulsory insurance, because of course, at, at the moment, insurance is, you, you insure the driver, not, not the vehicle. Uh, in, in a driverless car, that creates a certain amount of change that needs to occur, because you won't have a driver to insure. The, the draft bill gives some expected timescales. The government assumes that dry, driverless cars will be introduced in the UK in five to ten years. That is between 2022 and 2027. But meanwhile, car manufacturers have been announcing driverless cars on much shorter timescales than that. And it seems likely that highly automated cars will be driving themselves with limited and, and sometimes no human supervision a long time before 2027. In this lecture, I'm going to explore what needs to be done to make driverless cars possible, to make them safe, and to make them of overall benefit to society. And these are the topics that I'll cover. I, I need to talk about the levels of automation because... There's some jargon that, that explains just exactly how advanced the automation is, and it's, it's important to, to get the picture of that. I'll talk about the plans and the timescales and the social benefits and the social problems that will be created. And then get on to the question of how safe is safe enough. How safe are human drivers, and therefore how safe do driverless cars need to be? What are the technology issues? What are the ethical issues? And, and how do we actually get there? What, what does the transition to driverless cars from our current situation look like? Now, these are the, the levels of automation that have, have been generally accepted. They come out of, of an American professional institution and they've been widely adopted. Level zero is a manual car. Uh, the driver steers, controls the speed, but may have some automation giving prompts if, if you're drifting out of a lane on a motorway or um, providing you with, with alerts if you're going too fast. A level one car can control the speed while the driver steers. Um, for example, uh, the kind of automation that, that um, provides cruise control or, or emergency braking. Uh, or steer while the driver uh, controls the speed, as in uh, parking assist, for example. But a level one car doesn't do both at the same time and obviously has to be very closely monitored by a human driver. A level two car uh, can do both those things at the same time, um, both steer and, and maintain speed. And so um, a working example of that would be... Um, perhaps managing to uh, stay in a lane at a reasonable speed on a motorway. Uh, but a, again, a human driver has to oversee what's happening all the time and be prepared to take over if the human driver believes that it's necessary to do so. A level three car can control and steer at the same time under limited conditions, such as creeping along in a, a traffic jam. Um, and under a wider range of conditions uh, than a level two car. And the driver doesn't need to monitor the driving in a level three car, but must always be able to take control if the car sounds an alarm, if it runs into difficulties that the driver, that the, the automation can't cope with. A level four car doesn't need a driver at all under a, a limited set of use cases. Um, the, the example that's given is 
is uh, urban automated driving. Uh, although it's not at all clear exactly what that means. I mean, I've seen cars get into situations on side streets in London that required the pedestrians to help a driver to get out of, of the mess they'd got themselves into, and it's, it's far from clear how, how a level four car would work. Indeed, one, one of the interesting things about talking about driverless cars and thinking about them uh, is, is that it changes your whole perception of what's going on around you, and you, you find yourself thinking all the time, how a driverless car would have handled that situation. So I, you're going to have some fun, I think. A level five car doesn't need a driver at all. It doesn't need a steering wheel, shouldn't have a, a steering wheel or, or manual controls in general. Um, none of the occupants need to be sober or, or to hold a driving licence because, after all, they're, they're not driving the car. Um, and, and therefore, a, a level five car is, is the first level that can undertake a, a journey under all circumstances completely on its own. Uh, you could, for example, send your children to school in it uh, and it would find a, a place to park and, and after to drop them off and, and wait for instructions as to what it was supposed to do next. Now, there's a lot of activity. These are some of the companies that have announced plans in this space and you'll see that Whilst a lot of them are car companies, a lot of them are also technical companies. And it's the technology companies, I think, that have, have really frightened the motor manufacturers into starting to move fast before the technology companies take their business away. Because, of course, cars are already computers on wheels, and a driverless car is much more of a computer than it is a vehicle. Most companies' plans uh, seem to be for level three or level four cars to be available uh, in 2019 to 2021 uh, with, with the promise of level five cars becoming available around 2025. Although, uh, in his usual style, uh, Elon Musk, Tesla's chief executive, has said he expects his level car, five cars to be available in 2019 ahead of the opposition. And, and he does have a reputation and a track record of delivering on, on the impossible things that he says he's going to do. So uh, I'm, I'm not betting against him. But uh, other manufacturers, of course, the announcements are being put out by their marketing departments. And as we all know, marketing departments have a habit of of promising things that their technical departments know perfectly well they can't deliver yet. Driverless cars are around. Um, they're being tested on, on public roads in quite a lot of countries, and uh, there was an announcement earlier this week, uh, maybe at the end of last week, that some testing of driverless cars on UK motorways is going to start in uh, 2019. So um, we are already seeing driverless vehicles going around at, at slow speeds in, in places like Milton Keynes with, with some human supervision. And a lot of testing is going on of driverless cars, uh, particularly in America, um, again, with, with human supervision. By the end of November, um, Google had... Um, driven a, a considerable number of miles in their driverless cars on, on roads in California. And the human had had to take over um, 341 times in about half a million autonomous miles on, on public roads. And this graph shows the uh, increase in the number of miles on average, driven for each time that the human felt that they needed to intervene. And it, it has crept up by the end of that graph, which was the, get it right, the third quarter of 2015. Uh, it had crept up to about 3,000 miles between um, the, the need for the human to, to take over. So, you know, the clear improvement, showing an improvement in, in the overall technology. But this was under fairly benign conditions uh, because of the sort of roads that they were driving on and the kind of speeds that they were driving at. And um, the weather conditions were, were reasonably stable, I think, as well. 
So, and it's interesting actually that, that Google seems to have stopped publishing this, this data. I haven't been able to find it since the end of 2015. So um, whether the law changed and the Californians said they didn't need to publish it anymore, whether they've been publishing it somewhere else and I just haven't come across it, I, I don't know. Why are we doing this? Um, well, apart from, from the, the rather cynical views that you may have seen in, in the trailer that I recorded, that, uh, that basically it's all about giving people enough time to, uh, to watch more advertisements and to shop online more, um, there are a range of social benefits that are, that are promised. The, the greatest expected one is safety, a big reduction in the number of road deaths and in the severity and number of road accidents and injuries. Uh, in the UK, about 1,700 people are killed in road accidents every year. Uh, over over 20,000 are seriously injured. And it's said that between three quarters and 95% of all road accidents are caused by human error. Now, I'm going to talk about um, because um, I, I want to, to look at exactly how how driverless cars may help here. A, a second benefit that is seen is that it, driverless cars will provide better mobility to people who, for one reason or another, either can't drive themselves or don't want to drive themselves. Um, children, uh, disabled people, the elderly, a, a range of uh, people, and presumably even disqualified drivers, although somehow that, that never comes to the forefront as a, as a benefit that's, uh, that's advertised. Um, this could obviously be a, a great social benefit, but realistically, it's only going to be level five cars that give you that ability, because anything below that, if the car's operating outside of the very limited circumstances under which it can complete the journey entirely itself. If, for example, it, it suddenly snows and it's not able to cope because its sensors have been um, covered by, by a snowfall, then people are in danger of getting stranded and not being able to do anything about it. So it's really the level five cars, the cars that have got the full range of capabilities that will provide that particular social benefit. Third expected benefit is, is a reduction in congestion and, and improvements in fuel economy because it's assumed that cars will be able to drive safely closer together, that they'll be able to cooperate over radio links and, and avoid congestion and, and avoid creating congestion as well. Again, we'll, we'll see in a moment how, how realistic that really is. And the fourth benefit is... is greater free time. An average UK driver spends 235 hours driving each year, uh, equivalent to almost six working weeks behind the wheel. And with driverless cars, that time could be spent updating a Facebook status or, or shopping online or watching YouTube videos of other people's cats. <laughs> and driverless cars may bring economic benefits because um, it's assumed that we'll, we'll get some slice of the action in designing and building them, in exporting them. Uh, that the cost of freight and, and uh, personal transport will come down because it won't need drivers. Uh, and perhaps higher productivity because less time will be wasted in, in driving to places. Now, those are the benefits, but there are problems as well that you can envisage. Uh, the House of Lords report on connected and autonomous vehicles uh, pointed out that the government commissioned a scoping study to understand the main social and behavioural questions relating to driverless cars. And this identified nearly 400 open questions and concluded that behavioural aspects of driverless cars have been under-researched. Humans are likely to bully driverless cars if they can, and if it's useful or enjoyable to do so, or could provide a good selfie... Or to a pedestrian crossing and wait for the lights to change if they could just step into the road knowing that the traffic would stop for them. Pedestrians and cyclists might take over the roads in cities, forcing driverless cars to give way and making vehicle traffic uh, stop completely. 
And drivers will, will rapidly learn that they can force driverless cars to give way. And, and that creates some interesting challenges for the designers of driverless cars because human drivers take risks and rely on um, visual cues like making eye contact with oncoming drivers in, in deciding to move out onto a roundabout, for example. It's not clear how a driverless car is going to be able to replicate that. Uh, and, and, of course, this combination of things might mean that a, a journey in a driverless car takes a lot longer than a journey in a human-driven car because the humans are constantly getting in the way of the driverless car and taking advantage of them. Uh, and, and that may slow down the, the take-up of driverless cars because it, it could become fairly, fairly boring going places in them. It's, it's not certain that people would be happy to be a passenger or to send their, their child to school in a driverless car if the route could take them somewhere quiet where somebody could step out in front of the car and force it to stop and break into the car and, and they'd be powerless to escape from, from any threat. It's not clear what the public reaction would be the first time that somebody in a passenger in a driverless car is robbed or assaulted or raped or murdered. And it could be a big, a big backlash that, that stopped the technology completely in its tracks unless we have prepared for it effectively in some way. And driverless cars will be used to make deliveries. But again, how will people react when the the first bomb is delivered by a driverless car, the first car bomb. Um, millions of people are, are employed as drivers, of course, and so a lot of jobs will be lost because drivers won't be needed, Al although clearly for many um, trips where, which are currently driven by humans, you, you still need a human at the other end to for example, to, to deliver the pizza or to, to unload the vehicle. Uh, it's not clear just how much benefit a driverless ambulance or a driverless fire engine would be. Um, and so you can see there are, there are a lot of trips where you're still going to need a human when you get there, and taking one along with you may be the right solution, although business models will change under those circumstances, of course. And so it's hard to predict how many jobs will be lost by the introduction of driverless cars. Hard to predict how many new jobs will be created as a consequence of, of creating and introducing, designing, building, and then using driverless cars. And, and even harder to predict what skills will be needed by the people who move into those new jobs. Although, as we've seen with the introduction of most new technology, that it's typically the, the people who are displaced don't have the skills rapidly to move into any new jobs that are created. So there is a, an issue. Now, we've, we've seen that safety is a, is a major benefit that's expected of, of driverless cars. Um, but how safe is safe enough? And it seems to me that the starting position has to be that because we're expecting driverless cars to have fewer accidents than human drivers, then we need confidence that driverless cars are on average safer than human-driven cars. So if that was, was a licensing criterion, if we, we were to say that for a new model of driverless cars to be licensed to, to be allowed on the roads, we had to have, let's say, 99% um, confidence that that fleet of cars would be at least as safe as a human driver, then that's going to require quite a lot of evidence. And it's not clear how we're going to produce evidence that could create that high degree of confidence. Human-driven cars are, are getting quite a lot safer. The number of casualties on British roads is half what it was in 1960. It's been falling particularly steeply since 2002 because of better safety technology in cars, mostly. Um, relatively few fatal accidents occur on motorways, where, of course, a lot of the mileage is, is done. Most are on rural roads, closely followed by the number in built-up areas. 
And these are the more challenging areas for the automation, of course. Human drivers have, have two to three fatal accidents per billion miles. So that sets quite a, a high standard for manufacturers of driverless cars to match or to beat. We've already seen that Google had tested their driverless cars for, for 1.3 million miles by November 2015, and that the safety drivers had felt the need to take over control about once in every 3,000 miles. So how much testing is needed if you believe that the evidence that you need can actually be achieved by, by testing? Uh, the RAND Corporation recently published a, a report um, which had the title, How Many Miles of Driving Would It Take to Demonstrate Autonomous Vehicle Reliability? And their conclusions are that they'd have to be driven hundreds of millions of miles and sometimes hundreds of billions of miles to demonstrate their reliability in terms of fatalities and injuries. That even, under even aggressive testing assumptions, existing fleets would take tens and sometimes hundreds of years to drive these miles. An impossible proposition if the aim is to demonstrate their performance prior to releasing them on the roads for consumer use. And they conclude, therefore, that at least for fatalities and injuries, test driving alone cannot provide sufficient evidence for demonstrating autonomous vehicle safety. Now, one of the solutions that is, is being adopted by the manufacturers is to uh, run their automation through uh, a very wide range of simulators in order that they can train uh, particularly the machine learning systems in, in the vehicle, against a lot of scenarios that they can put through the, the, uh, the simulators. But that really doesn't, doesn't solve the problem of getting these very high levels of reliability and safety that we're looking for. And it's worth remembering that as driverless cars are introduced onto the roads, humans will change their behaviour significantly. And therefore, the interaction between cars and humans, whether they're pedestrians or cyclists or, or drivers in, in other cars or people on horses, will change, and that will affect the um, necessary behaviour, the behaviour that we require from, from the driverless cars. So there, there is an extended period of adjustment, I think, between the, the automated systems of a fully automatic car and the way in which the environment is reacting to the presence of that car. Now, there are some te technical challenges that the manufacturers are going to need to overcome. Um, driverless cars behave, uh, de depend on a, a wide range of, of technology, including radar, uh, LIDAR, GPS or other satellite-based positioning, machine learning, other artificial intelligence techniques, um, uh, for example, for, for recognising road signs and predicting the behaviour of, of cyclists, um, high-definition mapping, and quite a lot of telecommunications. And the performance of these technologies will have to be shown to be good enough for the roles that they play in ensuring safe operation. And there's a, a general principle in UK law under the Health and Safety at Work Act that um, the, the risks of this technology, as with any other technology that may be used in a work environment and affect either workers or the general public, have to be reduced so far as reasonably practical. And, and that phrase is interpreted by the courts to mean that if, if you balance the, the cost of making an incremental improvement against the benefit, unless the cost is grossly disproportionate to the benefit that you achieve, you have to make that improvement. So there is a, a big challenge for car manufacturers and, and the technology companies working with them to demonstrate that they're producing cars that comply with the law. Every sensor or communications channel is a potential source of problems if it becomes corrupted or unavailable. And that could happen either accidentally or through deliberate interference. It's, it's easy to jam GPS, for example, using a 
equipment that's, that's inexpensive and easily obtained on the internet. I, mean, it, I don't know if you realise just how weak the GPS signal is at the point where it's received in a, in a, a sat-nav system or, or your smartphone, but it, if you put a low-power transmitter into a balloon and floated it over London, you'd take out GPS over the whole of the south of England. It, it is a very weak signal. It's um, minus 16 decibels for, for those of you. It's below the thermal noise level in the electronic circuit at the point where it's being decoded. It, it is an extremely weak signal. And there are spoofers. There are simulators, GPS simulators on the market inexpensively now that enable you to send out a spoof GPS signal that, that creates a, a positioning uh, signal that, that will be interpreted as whatever the spoofer wants it to be. These are used for testing systems, of course, but, but they're now being used for other purposes. Um, people who steal cars that have got trackers in them, for example, like to uh, be able to lie about where they are, so there's quite a lot of criminal use of these systems. Now, recent research has, has also demonstrated that the the vision recognition systems in, in current generations of, of automated cars can be fooled in some surprising ways. They've discovered, for example, that you can tamper with, with road signs in a way that is, is really quite subtle and not even noticed by a human driver, but which causes uh, an automated recognition system to, to re read a, a speed limit as a stop sign or or to read a stop sign as a diversion. So th there's going to be at least potentially quite a lot of fun to be had, I think, by, by people who, who want to cause degrees of mayhem. Or th the opportunities, for example, for people who want to make sure that, you don't, th that lorries stop driving through their, their village um, will, will be there and undoubtedly will be exploited. Hum humans are very inventive. It's, it's worth saying that vehicle software is not, not very good. The, the standards that are employed are, are not as stringent as the standards that are used in um, avionics systems, the, the um, flight safety control systems in, in aircraft. Um, and there have been um, some examples. I'll, I'll give you give you one in a minute, that, um, that shows that existing software in cars is, has, has quite a lot of, of problems. And when you re recall, as, as we discussed in an earlier lecture, that there are 100 million lines of software in uh, a modern car, and driverless cars will probably get more and more of that. And that even a good programmer, a really, really good programmer, uh, is typically making an error in, at very best, a thousand lines of code. That's an awful lot of errors in a hundred million lines, many of which will either be exploitable by by um, cyber crooks or or will cause random failures at at some point. The the particular example I wanted to point to is is the expert testimony in a, a court case where um, somebody who was driving a, a Toyota Camry um, unfortunately hit somebody as they were, were leaving at a motorway junction. Uh, the driver said that the car accelerated and was not controllable, uh, and, and Toyota defended the action. And after a lot of of legal wrangling, uh, an expert witness called M Michael Barr was able to get access to the software for the electronic throttle control system for that vehicle. And he found a, a serious range of defects. He couldn't prove that these had actually caused that accident, but he was able to show that they could have caused that accident. Um, he found that there were buffer overflows, in, invalid pointer dereferencing, stack overflows, um, un, undetected deaths of, of individual tasks in the software, um, unsafe casting, race conditions, and, and more than 80,000 violations of the MISRA C coding standards, which 
uh, the, which Toyota had, had said they'd been, been following. And there have been other uh, software um, problems that have, have caused the recalls of cars. So we know that there are difficulties in developing highly reliable software for cars, as, as you would expect. Now, cyber security is a, a major challenge because of the poor security properties of almost all software. Uh, the, as I said, the car industry doesn't have the same technical standards or technical culture as the aviation industry, uh, even though you might, you might think that because more passenger hours are spent in, in cars, the, the level of safety ought to be higher in, in cars than it is, is in aircraft. But if a, a cyber attacker could take control of a fleet of cars, all the cars that had a, a particular software component in them, which could be across a, even a wide range of manufacturers, I, imagine the chaos that could be created. Um, and it could be done by, by nation states, by terrorists, even by, by teenage hackers, if they discovered the vulnerability and, and decided to exploit it. Uh, a fleet of cars could obviously bring a, a city to a standstill. It could, it could close down the distribution of petrol from, from a refinery. If, if you're able to, to get the car to drive off the road, then obviously you could kill a lot of people. Uh, a driverless petrol tanker, or, or, for example, would be a fearsome weapon if, if it was able to be controlled by somebody with malevolent intent. And be able to show with a high degree of certainty that this software with, with, and, and all the sensors with, with all their uh, potential channels of attack are, are safe against this sort of cyber attack will require a, a complete change in, in the culture of the way that software is developed. You, you simply cannot show that the, the kind of degree of security that you would need through testing. It, it can't be done. So we've got our car with, with 100 million lines of, of code, uh, code in it. Uh, it will certainly contain a lot of errors, uh, and it will need to be updated. It'll need updating. The critical data will need updating, too. The, the maps, for example, will, will need updating. And you can imagine that, that these updates will be needed at least as often as the technology companies find it necessary to update their products, and also for an extended period of time. You, you wouldn't want to find that your car was no, no use to you anymore because the manufacturers had stopped maintaining the software after a small number of years. And, of course, that may force a complete change in, in the way in which cars are sold. It, it may be that, that the only viable business model is that they're leased, uh, and, and that will of course, open the possibility of charging people per mile for the use of them and, and so on and create all kinds of privacy problems because the manufacturers will know everywhere you've been, all the journeys. And, but you know, that, that, there's a, a range of issues that grow out of the maintenance problem. But, but there's also the problem that, that every software update to a driverless car essentially is a new vehicle. Potentially, it could change the behaviour that has been licensed for use on the roads. And so how do you validate each software update enough to be able to trust it? How can you make sure that the, the uh, cyber vulnerability and the, the ability for somebody to take it over isn't being smuggled into the software update? And many of us will have experienced the problem that when you update a, a technical product, sometimes it doesn't work the way you expected it to anymore or even at all. And so quite a lot of people adopt the policy that they won't take the first update immediately. They'll wait and see what problems other people report. But the law it looks as though it's going to require you to take the updates, otherwise you'll invalidate the insurance. And it's not clear how that interacts with the fact that you may be... 
uh, the updates will almost certainly have to be delivered wirelessly. You can't be posting out USB sticks to people and expecting it all to, to be plugged in and, and done very promptly. And, and you might very well have parked somewhere where there is a very poor signal. Um, Quite a lot of the country has very poor signals. And if you're trying to, to download what might maybe gigabytes of data over a wireless link, it could take a very long time. And that, that creates a, a number of issues. Will people guarantee the maintenance for long enough? And will we need to change the MOT test to say that if a vehicle hasn't been updated to all the latest software standards, then it fails its MOT test and it's not legal to have it on, on the roads anymore. Will it be possible to do third-party maintenance, which is, is currently required by, by law? The manufacturers have to make that possible so that they don't mon monopolise all the, all the maintenance. But it's not clear how you can permit third-party maintenance without, again, opening up a, a wide range of, of channels through which cyber vulnerabilities could be created. And then when there are accidents, as, as undoubtedly there will be, um, it, it'll be important to, to a range of people to establish who's liable, what was the cause, how did it happen. And the vehicles will have collected a lot of data, but this data is currently seen as proprietary by the manufacturers. It will be in proprietary formats. It will have been collected at various points in a very complex system, and so interpreting the data will require detailed knowledge of the architecture of that vehicle and, and its technology. Expertise that will only exist within the manufacturer and, and yet, if the vehicle is found to be at fault in the accident, it will be the manufacturer that is carrying the liability. So there's a clear conflict of interest there, which I don't think is going to be easy to resolve. The, the government has proposed in its, its latest um, response about the uh, insurance of driverless cars that there should be a single insurance policy that covers the vehicle and, and, and covers it for accidents that occur, whatever the reason, even if, it, even if it's been hacked. Now, leaving aside the problem that that creates for the insurance companies, that it's, it's hard to know how they can price that risk, given that a single uh, cyber attack could affect an entire fleet of vehicles and create a liability that could put even a large insurance company out of business. And it could be triggered overnight simultaneously in all the cars because that's the nature of, of a, a cyber vulnerability. Le leaving that aside, how on earth are we actually going to get to the root of what it is that's causing the accidents to occur and and how will the information be made available to accident investigators either because they need it for civil litigation purposes or perhaps for, for criminal prosecutions so the police have a real interest in that but again they certainly don't have the technical ability at the moment to to be able to process the, the volume of data and and the very detailed technology that that will be needed to really get to the heart of, of what has caused an accident. And um, in the UK, we have a, a unique problem, I think, that there is a presumption in law that a machine is working correctly. And, and if you want to challenge that, uh, the burden of proof is on, on you as the challenger to show that, that actually the machine isn't working correctly. And... I, I simply can't see how you can possibly do that because you will need access to all this data and all this technical knowledge. And, of course, the, the people who hold that knowledge will be the very people that you're, you're trying to win against. So it, there is a, a serious issue there, I think. Ethical issues. Should a driverless car protect its passengers above all other road users, even if that means... For example, swerving into a group of pedestrians. 
Accidents will occur. Children run out into the street chasing a ball. Cars have to swerve to avoid them or, or hit the child. And whoever is designing the algorithms in a driverless car has to decide which of those actions they want to take. The manufacturers say that they will prioritise hitting another vehicle over hitting a person because other vehicles will have passengers who are protected by airbags and other safety features. That sounds fine until you realise that it, it creates a, a very easy way to cause cars to crash into other cars and that that will undoubtedly be exploited for criminal purposes or, or again, just for sport by vandals. So that alone creates a dilemma. But the bigger problem of how you choose between a range of, of uh, unavoidable accidents is a, a very hard ethical problem and one that ethicists have been working on for decades without coming to any sensible conclusion. They, they call it the trolley problem and if you look it up on the internet you'll see plenty of discussions about it. Now, the, the government set aside this, this difficulty in its current proposals. They, they argue that um, manufacturers will very quickly come to an agreement with insurers about how the information and, and the decisions about liability uh, will be allocated because the insurers have such power that they will simply refuse to insure the, that manufacturer's cars if the manufacturer doesn't, doesn't agree to cooperate. Now, that seems to suggest to me that there isn't a competitive insurance market when we know there, there is and that there will always be an insurer who's prepared to, to take a risk, at least in the short term, in, in order to get the reward of, of insuring those cars. So that seems to me to be impossibly naive. That problem still has to be resolved. It's one of the many outstanding issues. And car ownership, of course, may, may disappear because you don't own most of the software on your computer anymore. You only lease it. If you don't believe that's true, just read the terms and conditions that you signed up for without reading them. And, and, and you've seen the way that, that major companies are moving to, to leasing models for, for every year. You, can, you can't buy Microsoft Office anymore. You have to lease it. It's not available to buy. So presumably the same will be true of the software in your cars, in which case you don't own the, own the car if you don't own the software that makes it a car. I want to spend a little time pressing home this point about, about cyber security because it, it's a complete game changer. When we were only worried about things failing randomly, the chance of it failing in your car before it had happened in a lot of other people's cars and a fix had been found and, and your car had been recalled or it had gone in for its next service, that was sufficiently low you didn't need to worry about it. But a cyber attack is different. Once the vulnerability is known, it can, it can be left dormant until you want to trigger it and you can then trigger it everywhere it exists, essentially simultaneously. So if you're a terrorist or a nation state adversary, and nation states will compromise this software because every developed nation has an offensive cyber program now as part of their, their defense program. Well, I'll talk more about this when I come on my computers and warfare talk late in early next year. But, but those offensive cyber programs would be totally incompetent if they weren't compromising this vehicle software. Of course they are. And we've seen from, from the things that have been released by, by Snowden and, and as a result of, of the Shadow Brokers uh, attack and, and release of the, of the software that, uh, that was then used in, in the WannaCry ransomware, that the NSA is, is also developing offensive cyber weapons and, and making them easy to use and, and losing control of them and having them published all over the internet. And, and so those risks will exist. Nation states will have that power. 
and could therefore take over a substantial number of vehicles all at once. And if we want to prevent that happening, it's either got to be done by deterrence, which is jolly difficult in the cyber world, because it's very hard, certainly in the short term, to attribute where an attack is coming from. Um, or it's got to be done by making the software secure so that it is not vulnerable to cyber attack. And that is feasible, but it would be a complete change in culture in the way that software is developed in, in the car industry at the moment. And so if, if we really want to go down that path, we need to be setting off in the right direction, and at the moment we're not. So we, we have a, a problem. When, when we recognise that the cyber threat is, is a tier one threat on the National Risk Register, and at the same time we talk about creating very widespread new critical national infrastructure, which we, we know at the moment we can't make cyber secure. And, and you can attack these vehicles through so many different routes. Um, We've seen an example already of a text message that caused a buffer overflow and gave the attackers control over a vehicle. Um, even the digital radios, because of the architecture of the vehicle, can be compromised and then give you access to the, to the control systems. And at the moment, most cybersecurity <coughs> depends on penetration testing, and we know that doesn't work. That, that can only ever show you that you've found some errors. It can never give you high assurance that you've found all of them or enough of them. So the cyber risk is, is serious and it will get worse, is my, is my conclusion. Then how, how do we get there? How do we make the transition to driverless cars? In the lower levels of automation, you, you have to monitor the behaviour of the car at all times. That's more stressful than driving. Um, one, of, one of my colleagues who has a, a high automation car says it's, it's like teaching your teenage child to drive, only quieter and more, more boring and more tiring. Um, in, in the level three cars, the driver has to be able to respond to, to an alert and take control very rapidly. How rapidly? We don't know yet. But in simulation, it can take actually up to a minute for a driver to respond to an alert and get back to the, to the state of being able to really control a car, particularly if it's travelling at speed. And we know from, from automation in aircraft that pilots get quite good at ignoring alerts because of you, you get a number of false alarms and you gradually learn to ignore them. Uh, pilots have flown perfectly good aircraft into the ground uh, and, and the accident investigators have found on the cockpit voice recorder sirens going off, pull up, pull up being, being shouted and the pilots continuing to talk about what flavour of pizza they were going to have when they landed in the airport that they were, were heading into. And this is, this is really, you know, it's horrible stuff to listen to, it, but it's, it's realistic. And, and because driverless cars will be bullied by other road users and by humans, you might expect that the level of accidents will actually increase because the, the driving behaviour of the humans will get worse. So it's possible that in the, in the early transition phases, the accident rates will actually go up. And under those circumstances, you could imagine that the policy decision has to be taken, that you have to, to separate driverless cars from, from humans. And perhaps at some point in this transition, that you, you just have to say, it's not safe to have humans driving cars. They're, they're creating too many accidents. What we need are completely driverless cars only. So it may become illegal. It may have to become illegal for social reasons to, to drive yourself at some point in the future. So I, I, I conclude that the technical and social problems haven't yet been solved. There are some major research challenges here. And 
that the social implications are really not well enough understood. Uh, and we can talk some more, if you like, about the, the technical problems that are not well enough understood. But the, the social problems feel to me to be, to be one of the major challenges. So is society ready for, for driverless cars? Well, here, here they come. This is, is an announcement just, just a week ago that, uh, that Waymo is doing away with its, its safety driver in, in its uh, fleet of, of uh, taxis. So uh, it will be interesting to see exactly what the reaction of passengers is to, to having... Uh, fully driverless cars uh, and being expected to become passengers in them. So is society ready for driverless cars? I, I look forward to, uh, to hearing your views and thank you very much for listening.